an order is a subring that is finite over z, right? And they're all contained in OK, and OK is itself an order, how can they not be? Yeah. Okay, so maybe you go to the problem session and let yourself be enlightened by Dan, his, my TA. Other questions? Okay, thank you. So let me tell you something about OK. Here's a theorem. It sounds a bit like theoretical computer science. The following two problems are equivalent under what people call polynomial reductions. And there are several not entirely equivalent definitions of, of this, but they are for the moment pretty much irrelevant. So let's not attempt to teach a course on theoretical computer science. The first problem is output uh, k, and I explained yesterday how k was going to be specified to an algorithm compute OK. And the second problem is on input a positive integer M compute what people call the radical of M. The radical of M is the largest square-free divisor of M. And this second problem is pretty much impossible. The general feeling among people in this field is that it is just slightly easier only than factoring M. That is the best people know. If you know the complete prime factorization of M, you can clearly write down the radical of M. But for the radical of M, you need, it is, well, it suffices to have less information. So just to mention what I mean by this, if you want to factor M, then it suffices to know all prime factors of M that are at most the square root of M. But if you only need to know the radical, then it suffices to know all prime factors of M that are at most the cube root of M. And then you have to do a little computation, check whether the complementary divisor is a square or not, and then you will know the radical. So this is pretty much an impossible problem. And that implies that this first one is pretty much impossible. And you can already see that by thinking about the case that k is q square root m. Let's say that m is not a square. If you want to determine the ring of integers of q square root m, so k is given by the basis 1 comma square root m, that is essentially equivalent to knowing the largest square divisor of m. And well, knowing the largest square divisor or the largest square free divisor is also more or less equivalent. So even for quadratic fields, it is generally out of the question that in the worst case you are able to compute the full ring of integers. I told you, are you already by indicating this quadratic field how you prove one reduction? If you can do this one, you can do that one by looking at quadratic fields. The converse, I hope to say more. If you can find radicals of positive integers, then you can compute rings of integers. That is something that I hope to explain in my lecture tomorrow. And 
the situation with this OK is even worse. Namely, not only can you not find OK, but if someone else finds it for you, then you will have great trouble verifying it. So there are two other problems that are equivalent, namely on input K and an order in K, you may want to know, is this order, yes or no, equal to the maximal order? So this is simply a decision problem, yes or no. The answer is a single bit. And then here the question is, given a positive integer, is m equal to its own radical? In other words, is it square free? Nobody knows a good test for this. Nobody knows a good test for this other thing. So for the purposes of doing algorithms that we can nowadays prove to be polynomial time, we have to avoid making use of these ring of integers. We cannot have the desire to compute the ring of integers until a major breakthrough in algebraic, in algorithmic number theory, I mean, is taking place. So that is a serious problem in in the light of this comment. But the way we will save ourselves of this problem is that we really do need <coughs> all ideals to be invertible, but only those that we encounter in a but in solving a particular problem. And that will refer to only finitely many ideals. So let me formulate what we are going to be interested in. So, given a finite non-empty set, S in K star, we are interested in subrings, preferably orders, R of K, for which the fractional ideal R S, which is generated by S, is R invertible. So, for example, in my motivating problem with the ZA and ZB, this S may just consist, like over here, of two elements, alpha and beta. And such rings certainly exist. For example, R equal K is a good choice. K times S is simply K. Not, not maybe not too interesting, but of course OK also does it. And what is not so very well known and something that I have not been able to find in textbooks on algebraic number theory, that given S, there is a perfectly canonical choice for such an R, and that is, as it happens, the smallest R, the unique smallest R with this property, and it is an order. And before I formulate this result, let me replace this set by the group it generates, so that is Z times S, which is just a finally generated non-zero additive subgroup of 
k, and it is clear that rs is the same as ri, because r times z is equal to r. So here is the theorem, I think the last theorem from my first lecture was number three. Here I had two theorems, four of which I half erase, and five, so this must be six. And this is about the problem I just mentioned, so my k is a number field, I don't write it down again, so let i in k be a finitely generated, as before, additive subgroup, which is not zero, then we can blow up i, then there is a ring that from its properties is clearly unique, so let me write it down that it is unique. There is a unique uh, subring which in the notes is called BL of I, the blow up of I of K. And this blow up has a property that for all subrings R in K, it is true that R has this desirable property that Ri is R invertible. If and only if R contains this blow up. So in other words, among all those rings, there is a unique one that is minimal under inclusion. In particular, it is true that the intersection of all R's with this property also has that property. And if you see a straightforward proof of that, I will be very happy to hear about it. Now this theorem is not finished yet. Let me continue with some properties of this blow up. This blow up, you see the to the best of my knowledge, non-trivial content of this theorem is really the existence of this blow-up with this property. Once you have the existence, the properties that I am writing down are more or less immediate. The first is that it is an order. This is an order in K, and that is, of course, a consequence of the fact that one of these R's is OK. OK has this property, so the blow-up must be contained in OK, and yeah, that sub of an order is again an order. However, there is not the slightest reason that this order is an order of full rank. K need not be the field of fractions of this blow up. And let me continue with describing the field of fractions on this other blackboard. This field of fractions, actually it is true that every subring of 
has field of fractions equal to the Q vector space it spans, and that Q vector space is the field, well, you might think the field generated by I, but that is not completely true, because uh, if you multiply I by a non-zero element of K, then this blow-up does not change at all, and it is only the ratios of the elements of I that is important. So this is, let me explain this in a moment, if I take any x in I that is non-zero and I divide all elements of I by that element so that now in the new I the unit element is present and then this field generated by the new I will be the field of fractions and this animal here will be the union over all uh, N let's say of I modulo X to the N. I should also explain what I mean by powers of subgroups. Let me do that in a moment and first finish the state of the theorem because it, there are two other properties that are important. The first is that for all, as I mentioned already, non-zero elements of K, one has that the blow-up of alpha I is the same as the blow-up of I, simply because if I multiply such an Ri by alpha, that does not affect the question whether or not the group is, the R ideal is invertible. And there is another change you can make to I without changing the blow-up. And for all positive integers n, one has that the blow-up of I is equal to the blow-up of I to the N, where I to the N is simply the repeated product of N copies of I. So that also explains what I mean by I over X to the N. This is an increasing union because I over X contains the unit element. Also, this is quite obvious because if I is invertible, then the nth power will also be invertible. It's a group after all, the invertible ideals. And the converse is also very easy to check. This takes a little bit more effort to prove, but it is again a fairly immediate consequence of the basic defining property of this blow-up. So the non-trivial part of this is the existence, although I must say that I can imagine that if you know more algebraic geometry than I do, that this might be easy for you to prove by first constructing your blow-up not as a ring, but as a scheme, and then invoke some theorem that in our context this scheme has to be affine with the function field sitting inside K. Can I ask a question about this? Yes. Uh, how do you get denominators in the union? So what is the question, the denom? The equality uh, of the Q bracket per bracket. Oh, yeah, maybe I should have explained this. I mean the field generated by I over X, and this is the ring generated by I over X, the Q algebra. So I'm asking that one and the union below it? Oh, yeah, you are right. That is not correct. There should be a Q there. Uh, where is my chalk? My chalk, okay. Thank you very much. If you put a Z there, then you get, so this is, this is Q. Thank you. Other comments? 
Oké. Okay. So the best way that I know myself to prove the existence of this blow up is by writing it down and that will also be helpful to fulfill another ambition that we have, namely compute it in polynomial time. And to motivate this description of the blow up, let me write down an easy argument giving a hint where you should look for the Rs with this property. So suppose... One question? Uh, I was, I'm just wondering whether this blow up is related to the blow up in algebraic geometry. Yeah, 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 yeah. That is something that uh, I have no doubt uh, is true, but you have to sort of decipher the meaning of many script characters in Hertzhorn's algebraic geometry in order to be sure. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so, so suppose that Ri is R invertible. So that means by definition that there is some J with this property. Then what we do is that we look at what people traditionally call multiplier rings. So let me write down some notation, maybe I just call it H. If H in K is an additive subgroup, which is in principle just a Z module, then I will need the multiplier ring, which in the olden days was written as H divided by H, and that is the largest subring of K over which H is a module. So that is the multiplier ring of H. And it is quite easy to show that the multiplier ring of a ring itself is the ring. And if this ring is of the form Rij, then I can replace R by Rij, and it is very easy to see that if you have a ring over which I is a module, then Rij will also be a module over that ring. So you have this inclusion. So you see from this that all these Rs have to contain this ring. I divided by I. Now, even if I has rank greater than one, it is in general quite likely that this is just Z, and then it will certainly not be invertible. Invertible Z ideals have rank only equal to one. However, if Ri is R invertible, then by what I've been saying over here, I to the N is also